when I was little, it was okay for me to be a tomboy. But as I started to age, they wanted me to be a lady, which I was not. And I kept thinking, I need to change. I need to be more feminine. I need to be more like a woman. And for me, when I thought about femininity, I thought about being a woman. I thought about being skinny. And that unfortunately led this type A brain down the wrong path of anorexia nervosa. I struggled with anorexia nervosa for over a year before I was finally forced into seeing a therapist on campus. And so what I started doing with her is I started to create artwork to try to share what I was feeling. And this picture really stood out for me in looking through my artwork in the past. I took this into her one day and I said, when I talk about feeling fat, this is what I'm talking about. The white represents my body, the form that it should be, the form I feel people should see. The black represents what I define as my fat. It defines what I talk about when I talk about feeling unnatural or disgusting. This is what I'm talking about. And so we were looking at it, and she was trying to break it down with me, and we are trying to talk about how fat's not a feeling and how this is not really reasonable thinking. But looking back at this now, after my transition, what I realized my artwork was doing subconsciously that I could not bring to the conscious level is it was showing my masculine identity being masked by this femininity that was not mine. Even if you look at the curves, the very natural curves of a female form, I was rejecting that, and my eating disorder was a metaphor for that. Uh, so it was really powerful to see this. Fortunately, after four years of working with my therapist, I started making steps towards recovery. And that first step was exploring sexual orientation. And I was terrified of doing that, right? And I remember my therapist gave me this book. It's called The Dark Side of the Light Chasers by Debbie Ford. And Debbie has this theory that we all, anything that we're struggling with, whether it be addiction, depression, other mental illnesses, it could be that we're struggling with something that we can't bring to our conscious level. So this book was designed to help us bring that out. And one chapter in this book, she listed 250 derogatory terms. And she, what she wanted you to do is she wanted you to sit in a room by yourself where no one could hear you, so you'd let go of any adult filter, right? And she wanted you to state each word out loud and see how you reacted. And her theory was if you hesitated, if you got goosebumps, if your stomach cinched up, if you couldn't say it, any type of reaction to a word, that could be an issue that you're dealing with. And so I was going through this activity, and I was like, okay, 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 I can say these words. And then I came across one I couldn't say. So I stepped into the bathroom to have an even further distance from me in the real world. And I said, all right, I'm going to look in the mirror. I'm going to say the non-derogatory term, because I can do that. And non-derogatory term was lesbian, which I was able to whisper. All right, the derogatory term in the book was dyke. And at that moment, I knew I had to start looking at sexual orientation. So first, being the scared person I was, I went to our library, and I got some research articles. And then I went into the stacks of our library where you get the great Ann Banyan pulp lesbian fiction novels, which back in the 50s when they published these, they're like, no woman's going to buy these, right? So we're going to give them scantily clad covers with these really racy titles and market it towards the men. <laughs> these are very embarrassing to check out of a library when you're exploring your sexual orientation. So I stacked other books around it so they'd have to scan it and try to get them distracted. <clears throat> I took these books home. And then after I got through those, I went to Blockbuster and I started renting all the different gay and lesbian films, which are so cheesy, but you have to love them anyway. And one day I was standing in line and there was a movie in the discount bargain bin for $4.99, which is the same as renting it. So I was like, well, this is economical. So I bought it and it was Kissing Jessica Stein. Oh my gosh. Kissing Jessica Stein and I. I'm surprised I didn't break that tape. <laughs> I watched it every day for six months. It's all I did, because I was too scared to come out to the community. But when I came out, my eating disorder behavior started to decrease. And each step I took from that, it got better, which is amazing. So coming out, I don't say single long. I started dating a woman within a week <laughs> of coming out, who then became my partner. And being in that relationship felt right, in the sense that I wanted to be with a woman. But my body still felt wrong. And I didn't understand what that meant. And I also struggled still severely with body dysphoria and distortion. And I didn't understand what that meant. Then I also struggled with suicide ideation every day still. And I felt really defeated. I was like, I thought this was my big hurdle, coming out as a lesbian. What's going on with me? What am I not getting right now? Eight months with my partner passed, and we decided to go to Boston for a vacation. And we ended up in the transgender section, and I found this book on the shelf called The Body Alchemy by Lauren Cameron. 
and it's photographs of different people who were born assigned female but had transitioned to male. And along with the photographs, there were little stories, just little teeny vignettes to look through. And looking at this was my beacon of light. I finally understood at age 25 that I was a trans man. It didn't, it didn't really, I'd stuffed it down so far from my childhood, it wasn't able to come back out until I saw this book. Uh, with testosterone, I decided I had to come out to my family because at first I thought, well, maybe if I didn't tell them, they wouldn't notice, <laughs> right? Denial could be powerful for all of us. And I came out through a letter talking about the F word in my family, which is feelings, right? And I talked about my process, and I said, you just take your time. When you're ready to talk to me, I'm here. Well, it didn't take much time. My mom called me right away. And for the next six months, I was told it was just a phase, how I was just a tomboy, how I was nothing like a man, how I didn't know what I was doing, how I just needed to slow down, how I'm causing problems in the family. And at the same time, my dad refused to talk to me, and he said I was dead to him. He removed all my stuff out of the house, would not talk whatsoever. Six months in then, they decided to finally come and see me. So six months after chest surgery, five months after being on testosterone, they come to my house, and I was living in Lincoln, Nebraska at that time, and my dad walks up the steps, and he barely even looks at me, right? And he goes, and he sits down on the couch. And then my mom comes in, and we're standing there, and it's really tense in the room, and I have this trait for my mother. When we get nervous, we just start to giggle a lot, right? It's kind of an annoying thing to have and try to be more conscious of it this time. And so I was like, hey, mom, let's just go down through the house. Let me show you around. So we walk through the house, and we end up in the basement, and right when her feet hit that floor, the very first thing she did was lunge at me and grab me and hug me and say, I will always love you, which was so nice to hear because I'd never, I hadn't heard it in a long time. <clears throat> The one problem, though, <laughs> is she said, but you'll always be my daughter. And I was like, ah. Uh. <laughs> you know? So I felt the same way. Yay, oh, man. <laughs> so baby steps, though, right? Things take time. We have to have some patience. And so we go back upstairs, and we sit down. For 45 minutes, my dad doesn't say a word. And then finally, my grandmother gets brought up, my dad's mom. And she, unfortunately, got diagnosed with Alzheimer's as I was getting my chest surgery done in the same facility. My dad was in the same place getting that diagnosis. And so my mom said, what are we going to do with your grandma? She's as confused as it is. We can't tell her this. And my dad looks at me and says, you're never to see her again. You're dead to her as far as I'm concerned. <clears throat> that was 10 years ago. The picture up in the corner is from 2012, right? 2012. That's the first picture that I've had with my family. And it was at my wedding, all right? First time that we got together all of us together again. And it was a really important day to me to have my mom and dad there, to see my wife's family, my friends, to recognize that I don't have five heads growing out from different sides of my body, and to see that love is more important and lasting than judgment or prejudice. So. A thing that I think is important for us all is to recognize all the complexities of who we are and we're more than one identity. So yes, I am trans, but I'm also a hiker. I love to drink microbrews, just FYI. Uh, I uh, try to be the best husband that I can be, a good friend, a mentor, uh, and just a human being. And that's for all of us. So I'm leaving. First, again, I want to thank you all for having me again, but I'm just leaving you with, again, continue to explore who you are. Because I always say all of us are in a constant transition in life. All of us, whether you're trans or not, life is a constant transition. So be open to who you are. And when you feel fearful, instead of running away from it, face it. Because when we face our fears, we're able to move forward in our own lives. So thank you, everyone, for having me. Let's give one more round of applause for Ryan Salins and all those from the transgender community who spoke tonight.